welcome to another Center for Progressive Urban Politics podcast. I am your host, Kevin Lin, and today is May 8th, 2020. And I have the distinct pleasure to have as my guest today, Joe Salatin. Joel is an American farmer, lecturer, and author who is a self-proclaimed Christian, libertarian, environmentalist, capitalist, lunatic farmer. <laughs> Joel's books include, folks, this ain't normal, you can farm, salad barred beef, pasteurized poultry pro profits, your successful farm business, being a lunatic farmer, the, mar the marvelous pigness of pigs, respecting and caring for all God's creatures, family friendly farming. Now, Joel raises livestock on his 550 acre farm, uh, uh, which is called Polyface Farm in Swoop, Virginia in the Shenandoah Valley. And uh, meat from his farm is sold di through direct marketing to consumers and restaurants. And Joel came into prominence uh, after he was featured in the best-selling book by Michael Pollan called An Omnivore's Dilemma. And he's been in documentary films such as Food, Inc. and Fresh. And Joel, it's a great pleasure to have you on the show today. Oh, it's my honor. I'm delighted to be with you. Thank you, Kevin. Well, great. I, I, what I'd like to do, Joel, is just kind of set up why I'd I'm, I'm really eager to do this podcast with you, and then we can kind of free form it from there. But here we are. I, I'm in Lancaster County, and there's some 5,657 farms in the county. We're number one in terms of productivity among non-irrigated farming counties. Uh, the total Output is about 1.5 billion in ag products sold annually. And you would think with the large Amish community as well as Old Order Mennonite community, you know, our farmers at a time like a stressful time like this would be really prospering or doing pretty well or at least staying uh, to that average uh, in the face of this pandemic. But a lot of farmers are really struggling right now. You know, for instance, uh, one family owned hog farm. Uh, there, he's seeing, seeing where uh, the uh, plants are purchasing about 20% less of his poultry product. And that's placing a lot of financial stress on his operation. Um, Patty Edelberg, of, she's the vice president of the National Farmers Union, Union told Time Magazine recently, we're going to see a lot more family-sized farms going out of business. But there are examples. For instance, there's one butcher in Philadelphia that sources all of their meats directly, and they're up 45% in this pandemic. So, and we also have thing, you know, a CSA here in Lancaster. Uh, it's called Lancaster Fresh Farm Cooperative. And it counts about a hundred farms as members, and which is pretty small when you look at the total number of farms in the county. But what I'm really excited about having you here today, Joel, is to take things down a notch and see what we can learn from you at that farmer level to where they can improve their, their business at their farm. And I have to think that, you know, if we could only imagine that if those 5,657 farms uh, were really strong and resilient in times like this, and even anti-fragile, so that when something bad happens, they're able to get a little stronger, that would be an amazing uh, uh, tradition to pass on, or a, uh, to pass on to future generations and ensure that this county will continue to prosper. Well, sure, uh, you know, I've, I've gone on record a lot of saying that the way to preserve farm land is to preserve farmers. And if you don't preserve farmers, you don't preserve farm land. And too, too many initiatives have dealt with, you know, zoning and taxes and, and you know, kind of, kind of um, uh, land type preservations, as opposed to looking at, at, well, what kind of habitat, what kind of climate can we create that, um, you know, that, that, that makes sure that we have a good environment for farmers to prosper. 
Right. So it's really, it's, it's, a, it's, you had to have an economic solution tied into all of this. And how have you, you've been very successful, Joel, uh, as a farmer, your business, but you don't wholesale out, you sell direct, or actually you do, but uh, you really, you sell directly to restaurants, you sell directly to uh, customers that look forward to buying your meats and your produce and, and other uh, things that you manufacture at your farm. Tell us, how did that all start, Joel? And why do you think you're successful? <laughs> well, those are a lot of loaded questions there. Um, I think it started because, well, my, my dad, uh, my dad was an accountant and um, he pushed a sharp pencil and I'm grateful for that and uh, have a lot of that, that business acumen that just kind of osmosis came to me from dad. Um, but he realized early on that as a very small farm, we could not make it in the, in the low margin commodity business. There's, there's a huge difference between commodity and craft. You know, mm -hmm. think about think of, think about a bowl that you would buy at a uh, whatever a, a, a big box store, a set of bowls, compared to a bowl made by a potter uh, on a potter's wheel down at a craft fair. Those are two very. They're both bowls, but they're very very different products, and the the economics and all the business surrounding them is very very different. The um, uh, so the, the, the industrial bowl assumes, you know, uh, assembly line production, uh, homogeneity, complete, uh, um, you know, sameness from bowl to bowl, <laughs> very low margins, but lots of volume. Mm -hmm. The other, the, the, the handcrafted bowl is unique. There's not another bowl like it. And, and it depends on a higher margin because it's it because it's not on an assembly line and it doesn't take that that potter if you go to that potter and say yeah i really like this bowl right here could you make me 20 of them and can you yeah. give me a, a half price if you make 20 that's the he'll say well it takes me just as long to make the bowl number two as it did bowl number one you know there, there's no there's no quantity discount and so and so dad realized early on that as a small farmer the margins in the commodity business are so low, the only way to be profitable is to increase the number of, of pounds or volume or whatever that you do. So you spread these very low margins over millions or you know, tons or whatever. And that as a small farm, we needed to have a higher margin and we needed to wear the hats of all those middlemen. You know, farmers complain all the time. Oh, the middle, the middleman makes all the profits, right? I mean, they, and, and and well, the middleman is the the processor, the distributor, the marketer. Mm -hmm. Those are all middlemen. Well, that's true. And if you try to put a truck on the road, you'll find out how expensive it is. And if you try to try to uh, uh, message into the marketplace and get people's attention to stop at your venue, you'll find out how expensive marketing is. And if you buy a bunch of stainless steel and build a processing facility, you'll find out how expensive processing it is. The, the, the point is that those, those middlemen um, are all part of this, of this chain, but the farmer being on the, on the front end of it is at the end of a, of a whip and always right. gets beat up. He always, the, the farmer, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be sexist here, it can be a she, but, but the farmer gets beat up on the end of this, of this whip going to the marketplace. And so early on, we realized we needed to wear all those hats. We need to be the processor, the marketer, the distributor. We need to mm -hmm. own that product all the way to the retail dollar. And if we could do that, then even as a small farm producing smaller quantities, we could make a nice living. Right. And, and that, that indeed has been, you know, part and parcel of our success. Now, uh, a, another element of that success has been that, that very early on, we began diversifying. We weren't just trying to sell grass finished beef. We had eggs, we had chicken, we had turkey, we added pigs. Um, and so we had a, a, a larger portfolio. Uh, you know, if you're in a vegetable business, 
you know you don't want to just grow potatoes. People won't come to your farm to just potatoes. They want potatoes and squash and watermelons and sunflowers and cucumbers and you know green mm -hmm. beans. Right. And, and, and so, so just like we say, you want to diversify your investment portfolio. You have to diversify your your sales portfolio. And uh, it doesn't mean you become a Walmart where you can get your oil changed while you buy diapers and bananas. But but, but you do the, what you know. <laughs> yeah, but but the but the one stop shop. If you can if you can put stuff together, that's good. And so so today, for example, um, once we started building a customer base. Then we started looking out to say, well, what else can we add? Maybe we don't produce it, but we do. But we do know a farmer that 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 does. And so now, if you come to our little farm store here, mm -hmm. or go on our website, you'll see that we have, you know, kombucha and ferments and chicken soup, and uh, soon we're going to have pot pies, uh, you know, meat pies, and we have honey and maple syrup and um, um, Goodness, we, we just uh, a month ago, uh, two, uh, uh, six weeks ago, we added uh, cheese from an artisanal grass-based dairy, and he does has a two a two doing uh, cheese. Well, I mean that's just selling like hotcakes. We're moving, you know, we're moving uh, what a thousand a thousand dollars a week of that. So you become, just, in fact, a destination in many respects yes, on on a retail yes, chain. Yeah. Yeah, that's the idea. And, and, and we take, and so, so from a marketing standpoint, the easiest way to increase your market is not to add additional customers, but to add more products to the customers you have. Well, you know, that's interesting because I was involved in a technology company that was building shopping carts for the, the very early home delivery, uh, uh, outfits out there like web van and home grocer and uh -huh. the problem Joel was they said okay we have to get that shopping cart over $84 if we don't we lose money if we do we make money and it was just about getting a bigger variety of uh, materials in, into that shopping cart yeah you're exactly right and anyone who does distribution and marketing I mean, look, if you've got a customer, turning that customer from a $100 sale to a $200 sale, that doesn't cost very much. You've already got the software. They're already on their shopping cart. The hard part is finding a new customer. And so, and, and, mm -hmm. if, and, and, if, you're, and if you're delivering, uh, then obviously, uh, um, if you're delivering, you want that truck as full as it can be because it takes the same amount of fuel to take that truck uh, with, you know, half loaded as it does loaded. I mean, not identical, but, but close enough, uh, not enough to, to quibble about. Are you able to compete with the chain grocers that deliver like the pod beans, the whole foods of the world? Yes, we are. In fact, uh, one of the things that we're doing now is actually going to a place like whole foods and putting their prices right next to ours. And, uh, you know, amazingly right now, our eggs, our eggs, for example, are, you know, uh, $6 and 50 cents at uh, Wegmans and Whole Foods, they're $8. Mm. Um, and so and same, same thing with uh, ground beef. Now you have to compare apples and apples. We're not going to, we're not going to compare our eggs to, you know, uh, factory organic, for example, um, uh, because they're two different things. Ours are pastured and those are uh, in what we call industrial organic. But anyway, when you compare apples to apples, uh, we're absolutely, here, here's what's happened. Um, as, the, as, as distribution has become more and more efficient, right. um, it, it, it has made it easier and easier for small people like us to access distribution. 20 years ago, there's no way that I, from here in Virginia and you're in Pennsylvania, there's no way that I could have competitively shipped you uh, frozen meat from our farm 20 years ago. No way. Today, today, I can ship that to you cheaper than it can be warehoused, wholesaled, and inventoried into Whole Foods. So this sounds like an amazing opportunity for the smaller operation because 
the, the sev when I was a kid, I grew up on, it was a hobby farm, really, when it all came down right. to it. Uh, uh -huh. But it was a time when everything was very local, like the butcher shop about was sure. employed about 30 people. It was local. It took in every, everyone from that area. And I know during the Nixon years, uh, that the, the emphasis was what the, what did they say they said get big or get out that's what they wanted right. to do uh, er, they, earl butts earl right. butts mm -hmm. yeah fence plant plant fence row to fence row get bigger get out that's right mm -hmm. yeah and now it just seems that that system which seems to be so, it, it's almost like it's such a, these complex systems over time they begin to break down and that seems is that do you think that's where we are joel these these complex supply chains are beginning to break down and is giving some opportunity for others? Yes. Well, back in those days, people inventoried stuff. You know, you were, you were planning. And, and, and now we've gone to just-in-time inventory. One of, one of the downsides of just-in-time inventory is when you pull the curtain back, there's nothing there. <laughs> right. Yes. As we're finding out right time. now. Yeah. Right, right. So, so the average city has three days' worth of food. Um, but when the city runs out uh, and, and just in time inventory, well, the warehouse also ran out and, and, you know, and everything down the chain. And, you know, when Joel Arthur Barker wrote the book um, Paradigms and basically introduced the word paradigms and to the shift. world. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, yeah. One, yeah, he did. One of the uh, axioms in the book Paradigms was that every paradigm eventually exceeds its own efficiency. And, and what he was saying was that, that, that paradigms change. You know, they, um, what we thought was right at one time. And, and so what's happened is our paradigm in the food business has been amalgamation, centralization, and, um, uh, and, and segregation, you know, uh, very specific um, industrialization. And we've run that paradigm, you know, up the wazoo. And this pandemic has now suddenly exposed the fragility of mm -hmm. that centralization. For example, um, right now we're having a big problem. The, the only place right now, as we're doing this uh, conversation today, um, what some 18 of the 20 largest uh, meat processing plants in the country are either closed or operating at half staff. Um, right now, the only place in America where thousands of people assemble every day, shoulder to shoulder, is at a big processing plant. They're not in the office buildings. They're not at stadiums. They're not at theaters. They're not at the ball game. They're, they're not even at funerals and weddings. You know, right. they're, they're at these big processing plants. And so just imagine if instead of these 100 mega 4,000, you know, employee plants in the, in the nation, if instead there were 200 of those 200,000 plants that employed fewer than 50 people spread out democratized democratized across the landscape in a decentralized pattern i could even use uh, covid terminology spread out let's instead right. of social distancing let, let's do let's do process density uh, 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 distancing let's do let's spread out across right. the landscape and, and it makes so, all so we, from, we from a, a health standpoint from a a national a food security standpoint yes. you know when yes. there's an e coli outbreak in one of these big plants it could impact 70 percent of the meat product on the shelves whereas well, so, if it were spread that, out yeah. right that, that's why when you when you see recalls it's all isn't it hilarious whenever you see a, a recall and you see here are the brand names and there's like like 12 brand names it's all coming out of the same spout you know it's the, it's the same stuff uh and there's 12 different brand names i mean right now right now a mcdonald's hamburger has pieces of 600 animals in it my gosh think about that one burger at mcdonald's has pieces of 600 animals in it when you get when you get ground beef from polyface it's one animal, one animal in that burger. And, um, and just that in and of itself is, is a tremendous uh, safety valve, you know, in, in the system. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to realize that, you know, if we, if we, um, if we centralize, we amalgamate and we, um, and we go to these mega plants, 
we're mm -hmm. we're courting some sort of a, a biological disaster um that has huge ramifications inherently simply because of the scale yes it does it does and, and, and so suddenly what happens in, in a situation like this is the 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 so the alleged efficiency of that system breaks down in resiliency mm -hmm. and so i'm the first to agree you know what we can't we can't process beef as as fast as a four thousand bird uh, whatever uh labor plant uh we don't have the bells and whistles we do a lot with knives and you know by hand mm -hmm. okay so so we're not as efficient but guess what our workstations are spread out because because we're not on an assembly line we're in we're in craft craft tables it's it's, it's right. a craft and so our little small plant that, that we co-own at, at 20 20 uh, employees my goodness, there's two guys out on the kill floor. There's, there's two guys over in the backpack room. There's four guys in the cut room. And, and we've never worked closer than six feet together. You know, it's, wow. it, it's, you know it, it, it's, a, it, it's a plant of expertise and artistry, not just. And, ju and just from an experiential standpoint, a quality of life standpoint, right. it has to be a much better place to work than let's say at JBS when you're there with 600 yes. other people and you're packed in and you're doing the same thing, throwing a leg here, cutting this every day. Right. Which, yeah, it, it actually, these, a, a smaller plant makes you, um, because one person is doing way more procedures, you're using more muscles, you're moving around, you don't get carpal tunnel syndrome, you don't get repetitive motion disease, all of these things, your, your, your physical, your body actually holds up and, and your, your emotions, your mental state holds up better because, yes. uh, b because you're, you're doing different things uh, throughout the day. And, and it's not just rote, you know, that they, they tell me that the average worker in a poultry processing plant can learn their, their job can be completely skilled at their job in 20 minutes. Because that's the division of labor down to yeah, that because kind that, of minutia. That's, exactly, that's the different. That's the division. So how how would you how would you like for your vocation to be something that it only took twenty minutes to learn? <laughs> wow. I mean, it's you know, it's, it's interesting you say that because we've been talking about the business of farming and you know the marketing aspects of that, the production aspects. But Joel, uh, there's a quote that stuck in, with me from one of your books. And it goes like this, orthodox industrial farming fails first because it fails to feed the human spirit. And I guess that's kind of what we're getting into with, you know, we've created this division of labor. There, there's, it's, there's no longer a labor of love. Because uh, you're, you're a very spiritual person in many ways. Uh, and you seem to inculcate that into everything you do. Is that an important aspect, do you think? You know, if someone wants to look at a farm as a business or not just a business, but a vocation that they want to devote their life to, is that an important aspect to it? Well, I think so. I, I think it, it completely changes the, the, um, the respect and the persona that we have as stewards of the land to realize that we are simply a part of something way bigger than us. Uh, if we come at it either as a as a surf and well, you know, I have to feed the world. I have to feed the world. I have to feed the world. You know, if 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 that's the way we come to it, we're we're we we will come with that mindset. Another mindset is is um, I'm in charge. I control, and this is just a bunch of uh, machinery, mm -hmm. and I'm just going to manipulate this machinery to my heart's consent. That, that's kind of the conquistador mentality. Um, that's another mentality. I'm going to control nature, bend it to yeah, my right. will. It will exactly, yeah, and 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 in fact, it includes the fact that that nature is is a reluctant partner. That that somehow nature is against us, and I have to I have to, you know. Uh, wrestle it and make it submit as opposed to nature being uh, a benevolent lover just wanting to be caressed into abundance i mean that's a that's a very different mindset and so i would propose that there's a that there's a a, a mindset that we can approach this and say look you know i don't own it it was here before i was here and it'll be here after i'm gone i'm simply a steward 
from my in, in my Judeo-Christian perspective, mm -hmm. I say, you know, God owns it. So, so what what's God's return on investment? Does God want a dead zone the size of Rhode Island in the Gulf of Mexico? Does God want polluted streams? Does God right. want uh, uh, bigger bigger deserts? Um, does He want um, immunologic immunological breakdown and pandemics? I mean, th these are all um, not good return on investments if you're if you're the creator. And so my responsibility as a steward is mm -hmm. to is, is to re is to massage it, to caress it, to re to to main to make it um, more productive, more abundant, so that the talents I've been given grow under my administration. It's interesting. I'm just looking at your the room. It, behind you is a really, really large bookshelf. <laughs> and yeah. as I said, I grew up on a farm in, a, in an agricultural area of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And I, I had never seen a farmer with a bookshelf as big as that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Teresa, my wife says uh, we need to build another house just to put all the books in it. But uh, yeah, I, I think there's a, um, you know, I, I am a reader and I am eclectic and I have a broad range of interests. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, I think there's a lot of wisdom in in um, reading reading mentors that are either living now or have lived in the past. There's a lot of wonderful mentors who are no longer with us that we can only access through their writing. I, I, I take it you've you probably read Hesiod's works in days. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm not familiar with that one. Hesiod's. You really should. It's a poem and it's a farmer okay. who lived in ancient Greece. Okay. And the, the amazing thing about it, he's, he's kind of you. He's talking about what you need to do in the winter and the spring and, uh -huh. you know, should you, you know, how to rehabilitate the land, what to do. It's like he's, he's always multitasking, but he's looking at oh, the deeper uh -huh. things and the more spiritual right. things that come with being part of that land. So he, uh, he, predates, Cic uh, he predates Cicero then. Oh, yes, absolutely. By a long ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. I'll have to look that up. That, that's great. There's, and, I mean, there's, there's almost not enough time in the day to read everything that's worth that should be read. That, that's a quick read. You, you, and I think you'll get a lot of it because uh -huh. uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Victor Davis Hansen. Yeah. Uh, he wrote a book called The Other Greeks. And amazingly, it's the only book I've read of his for all the books he is known for. And he has an amazing thesis statement where he said, democracy didn't come out of the polis, the, the cities. It came out of the countryside from the farmers. Because yes. when you look, what's the difference between the Persia and Greece. Well, Greece, they had the independent farmer, the people that were mm -hmm. had to make their own decisions, prudent decisions that were in many respects, life and death, either near term or long term. And that's where that independence and that democracy really came from. And perhaps one of the tragedies today is not having so many farmers part of our, our dialogue. Yeah, well, there's, there's uh, actually quite a school of thought uh, that 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 our republic, um, we're really a republic, not a democracy, but anyway, our republic uh, actually can't last unless we preserve a healthy agrarian sector of, of society. And when you realize um, how much stuff, how, how many, um, oh, kind of uh, major, altering situations start in the cities right i mean it's almost everything from from racial unrest to this pandemic to um you know starvation to riots um you know it, it, it the, in fact this pandemic if it hasn't showed up a divide between urban and rural i don't know what does i mean it, it very much you know centered in in urban um urban places. We have certainly seen, and, you know, I'm a, I'm an urban dweller, but at the same time, you have to look at, you know, if like New York City, you pack so many people right. in and you have, you know, COVID-19 knocks on the door. Uh, you have to take extra, extra extraordinary measures as opposed to 
you know, some safe distancing, you know, that are, you, you'll see, right. you know, in an agrarian, more spread out uh, area. Yeah. So, you know, what's, what's, what's going to be curious is, as, as, is if people make the connection between, okay, so packing into New York, uh, you know, piling on top of each other, that's where this thing, that's where the nexus and that's where this stuff really gets going. These large processing plants that gets going. So is anybody ever going to make the connection? Well, maybe, maybe we shouldn't have mega thousand animal feedlots. Maybe we shouldn't right. have mega thousand chicken poultry houses um, or, or pig houses, whatever. That maybe that's not healthy either for the, for the animals and the food system. Um, so far, I haven't heard anybody make that connection, but uh, it's, it seems to me like it's a pretty obvious one. Well, I just read a report this morning, uh, a, a newspaper article this morning that talked about New Yorkers looking to flee. And then yes. anecdotally, someone said, yeah, I know three people now that are talking about leaving. Uh, I yes. lived 20 years in Los Angeles and I just couldn't do it anymore. Uh. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, that's true. And in fact, all the, um, the moving companies in New York City, all their warehouses are packed to the gills because they're handling, they're handling um, clients who say, go clean out my, clean out my apartment, uh, put it in storage. I don't know where you're going to send it, but when I settle, I'll tell you where to send it. I mean, people are jumping out of the city. That's, so that is this, jumping. Wow. Yeah. So, so, this, so this brings up a, a fascinating thing, which challenges my libertarianism. And I actually don't have the answer, but, but I want to put it out so that people can think about it. So if we say we want to, that, that it would be good to have healthy rural communities that, that, that may be urban as maybe bigger than it ought to be. L l could New York still be New York with, with 3 million fewer people? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And so, it was I mean, New York still, with 3 million people. Yeah. It still had the Metropolitan Opera. It still had mm -hmm. theater. It still, okay. So, and and so I think cities is, do occupy an important place strategically. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. oftentimes you just look at the ground they inhabit, you know, it's a place mm -hmm. of culture and commerce. And, yes. Uh, yes. So much there, but do yeah. they have to be I, so I, densely packed and so yeah. ugly? <laughs> I, I, I agree. So where I'm going with this is that uh, you, you're old enough to remember, uh, whatever, 20 years ago, Y2K, uh, and, and, and 20 mm -hmm. years ago, we had, the, you know, the, the internet was really, was really developing, and there were all these business papers about people are going to work from home, they won't have to commute anymore, and all this, and, and, and and uh, we had books, you know, uh, business books written. You don't have to occupy uh, a place as long as you just occupy a space. And we're going to be liberated from the office, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Well, that did not happen. That no. did not happen. Why did, it, why did it not happen? Well, it did not happen because rural America was not keeping up with urban internet development. So, so, so what we have now is is just, ima just imagine mm -hmm. if, if, if TVA, if rural electrification had not occurred World War II-ish or, or around that time, where would rural America be today if we hadn't had these rural electric cooperatives and we hadn't had a system you know, to, to, to electrify uh, rural homes? Um, Today, I mean, the answer is obviously it would be way more backward, you know, yeah. than it is today. But and, remember, and, and so, I live in Lancaster County. So, yeah, with yeah. the Amish. So, <laughs> right. So, so today, so today, um, we we're in a similar situation in which the technology of the of the civilization has moved to, you know, to whatever, call it a, 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 a scale of, of eight, all right? And in the country, we're still at a scale of two. Um, and, and there are many things that I actually can't do here. We have as, as fast a Wi-Fi as we can afford and get, mm -hmm. but it's still, it's nothing compared to what a person 10 miles away in Stanton, which is just a 20,000 person city, the, the difference is, is unbelievable. 
And so now we're getting into here, here we here we want to spread out across the country. We want we've got this internet, we've got Zoom, we've got all these cool ways to to not have the commute, to to um, to create opportunities for people who want to live farther out and not commute to the city, but we don't have the capacity for electronic access that can that can compete in the marketplace with the urban sector. Yeah. And now, we, go ahead, please. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what it costs to get that, but I know one thing. If 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 at the stroke of a pen in 14 days our country can spend three three trillion dollars and and throw it into the into the <laughs> yeah. you know into Where the it world. Always goes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, you know, it, it, it seems to me like somehow, and here I'm talking not like a libertarian, but it seems like somehow we could we be creative enough to figure out a way to truly bring um, urban commensurate access to rural America. And that that would actually create economic opportunity and true fair economic choice for people who de who desired um, to you know, to not live in a in the middle of a city because yeah, a utility like that it, it brings all you know it's like a, the rising tide that brings up all ships yes yeah uh, it's fundamental and and as you were just saying earlier it's about knowledge that ability to tap into knowledge and tap into these right. networks uh, the uh, it's amazing you can do so much online right now and uh, yes. to be hamstrung with that, that, mm -hmm. that is certainly problematic. The, uh, yeah, typically, typically on my, on my zoom calls so far, we've gotten along very well right now, but uh, this is the third, uh, third zoom, zoom call I've been on today, podcast, conference, whatever. And, um, and the other two um, I got frozen out, you know, two or three times per 40 minutes, um, you know, it takes about 30 seconds for it to reconnect and come back on. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but that's, that's, that's completely symptomatic of our, you know, low scale, um, you know, Wi-Fi access. And, and so, and so it affects all sorts of things, you know, people, people want to do things with me or want me to download things. Well, I, I can't because it, it, crams up my system. It, it, it's too uh, uh, quirky. Right. So, you know, I, I, I mean, our, our farm store, we have people coming here, they're, they're coming here for food, because we have inventory. And, you know, two hours a day, we can't run credit cards because the internet is down. You know, that that is direct, that is direct rural economic opportunity. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, too, because, uh, I was reading in one of your books, you said this is a really amazing time for, for far, the, the farming in the United States because we have the farmers, it's a, it's a very old population in, you know, yes. in chronological age and many mm -hmm. will be retiring in the next 15 years. So that presents an opportunity for people yes. to come and perhaps mm -hmm. purchase a farm and, be, and begin the vocation of farming. And again, if they, they're able to quickly and easily learn from people like you, uh, uh, that's, it's all about knowledge transfer. Uh, that, that would yeah. be an amazing, com give anyone a, a competitive advantage uh, just getting into farming. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and not only just be able to do the knowledge, but just to be able to interact, to be able to interact with the urban sector. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we struggle here just interacting with the with the urban customers that we serve, um, just flowing information back and forth with our customer base. Uh, you know, it's it's always, well, how's the internet work? I mean, our greeting every morning uh, with staff is, well, how's the internet working today? You know, that, <laughs> <laughs> and and it's 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 hard for people in the city who just have all this it's hard for them to appreciate what a a tenuous just literally you know a minute by minute tenuous 
internet access, what it does to a, to a, a country, a, a farm business, to a country uh, enterprise, whether we were farming or making, you know, making uh, chairs or, you know, whatever we were, whatever we'd be doing here. Now, uh, Polyface, you're a 550 acre farm and by Lancaster County Science, that would be a large farm here. Uh, and a, a few years ago, uh, uh, my colleague, Steve Lamb and I, we did a, an interview with Joel Gervais of the family of uh, the Homestead Farm in Pasadena, California. And they were producing a few tons of vegetables on a fifth of an acre of land. So is scale important in terms of farming or is it using that scale for what you want to produce and ultimately sell? Um, yeah, I'm not a scale guy. Uh, I, I think that scale, um, well, many of my friends, I think, uh, overrate scale as if, you know, if you get big, then you're evil. Um, I don't, I don't adhere to that. And it depends on what you're doing. There are some things, let, let's say, you know, um, artisanal vegetable production, uh, that's, that's extremely, um, valuable per square per square yard and um it, it's extremely labor intensive uh and so a, a person you know one person can hardly handle more than maybe an acre and a half or two acres of of vegetables i mean it's intense if you ever grown a garden you know just imagine an acre you know and it boggles my mind we're in livestock we're in livestock so um, you know, in a little bit, I'm going to go up and move the cows. Well, I'll move, you know, uh, we can move a herd of 200 cows. Um, you know, I don't have to pick up the cows. I don't have to weed the cows. I don't have to, you know, they, they, I just call them and they <laughs> they're, come. They're ruminants. Themselves. They're just out there in, in, in the pasture. Yeah. yeah. And, and I move them. For, so all I have to do is set up an electric fence to control them for, for the day. And then, and then, you know, I move them. So, so some of these things, so that takes very little labor per acre, but it also doesn't return a lot per acre. There's kind of a, there's kind of a, a ratio or a, a relationship between labor per acre and return per acre. And as you, as you intensify, um, mm -hmm. as you, in, as you increase your income per acre, you also increase your labor per acre. You, you, you can't, you can't have both. That's the um, physics of farming then. It's, it's, that's the physics, yeah. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So, Joel, if someone were looking to get into, let's just say someone has been kind of a commodity farmer and they realize that that is not the way to, to continue and they want to get more artisanal, they want to uh, kind of broaden their, their markets, are there steps that you've, you know, have found the things that they need to first analyze and then take action on? Well, sure. There, there's kind of a step. Um, unfortunately, many commodity farmers are deeply in debt. Mm. And so, um, so the, 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 the way to create wiggle room for yourself in your business, the way to create wiggle room is to get out of debt. Now, they would look at me and say, well, how am I supposed to do that? And um, sometimes that means, well, maybe you have to sell 10 acres off of a corner to, to, to get to even. So you've got some wiggle room, but, but somehow you've got to create wiggle room. Mm -hmm. so, so you need a little bit of wiggle room uh, uh, financially. Secondly, you need to start feeding, feeding your mind uh, from a different trough. Um, you know, there's the, there's the, the orthodoxy <laughs> and then right. there's the non-orthodoxy and you need to start, start um, feeding more from the non-orthodoxy. And in fact, you might have to change some friends. You might have to surround yourself with people who think compost is cool and not, uh, um, and not going to kill us, uh, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so, so you need to maybe change your friends, change your, change what you're feeding your, your mind and, and that. Um, and then the third thing is you need to, to try something prototypically embryonically 
to build self to build confidence. So that's the uh, experimenter. Ever, yeah, the experiment. Yeah. So 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 take a corner, take something, and and do what you think might you know might work in this other this unorthodox uh, sphere, whether it's vegetables or cattle or dairy or whatever. Um, you know, if you're if you're dairying, maybe you know maybe uh, take two acres and run one cow and milker and just measure the milk, the, 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 the time, the labor and blah, blah, blah. Um, but, but the point is test. I mean, in business, we're always testing, right? You're testing, testing markets. Te I mean, customer surveys. I mean, we're, we're testing, testing, testing. So test procedures, test so that, so that in a year or two, you can say, yes, this worked, this didn't work. And, and you can build up your confidence level because when you're starting into something new, um, confidence where you're not just in fear and trepidation every day, uh, confidence is one of the you know, single most important factors to keep you stable as you head into risk. Um, you, you can't head into risk and be completely non-confident at the same time. I mean, look at the military. You know, a guy that goes into the whatever uh, uh, in a in a right. terrible in, in a terrible military situation. Why do they go in there? Well, because they've had training. You know, they're they're, they're confident in their, their training, their leadership, their apparatus. Okay, so they go where you know where you and I wouldn't go. Uh, and it's the same here. Uh, when you're when you're heading into a different situation, uh, you have to mitigate mitigate your own instability, your own emotional state with some successes, with some little test successes as you start in. So number one, uh, free up some, give yourself a little bit of financial wiggle room. Number two, um, associate your mind and your friendships with people who encourage you and don't discourage you in this. And number three, start testing embry embryos to find out what you think you can actually birth. Mm -hmm. Great, great suggestions, Joel. Uh, one last thing before we close, because we're certainly coming up on our hour right now. Uh, have you, I, I, I know you have your strong libertarian leanings, but are there things that could be done at the municipal, uh, county, state level, federal level that would help, that can help small farmers that's not being done? Or are there examples where it's being done well? Oh, well, um, my, you know, people say if, 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 if you were king for a day, what would you do, you know, <laughs> from, a, from a policy? From a policy standpoint, if you could do any one thing, what would it be? And the one thing that I would do is grant every American citizen the freedom of food choice uh, from the source of their choice. Right now, if in, in Virginia, if I wanna buy a glass of raw milk, it's illegal. I can't buy a glass of raw milk. Um, now, actually in Virginia, I can buy it, but you can't sell it. <laughs> so oh, the, okay. prohibition okay. Is on, <laughs> the, the prohibition is only on the seller, not the buyer. Um, and, and, and so, so what we have right now, the, the single biggest impediment to proliferating entrepreneurial uh, community, community scaled um, food systems is the regulatory environment that is extremely scale prejudicial. So, so, um, so if I, and, and this spans all sorts of things. It's not because, uh, you know, our crops figure so heavily into international uh, policy and diplomacy, selling, you know, feet, uh, you know super, or, or the supermarket to the world, more or less. Uh, is that all part of that? No, it's, it's, more, um, it's more consumers who are scared to take responsibility. This all really started mm. in, in uh, uh, 1906 when Upton mm -hmm. Sinclair wrote The Jungle and scared the dickens out of everybody with the large meat packers. And uh, of course, Teddy Roosevelt, who was a kind of a socialist guy, uh, he said, well, I'll fix them. And he started the, Federal, the Food Safety Inspection Service to control these, uh, these uh, bad meat processors. 
and we got the FSIS. Nobody dreamed at that time that by the time we went a century into that, you wouldn't be able to sell a glass of milk to a neighbor or make homemade, you know, charcuterie and sell it mm -hmm. to a neighbor or, or Aunt, you know, Aunt Patty who came over and wanted to buy a, a you know, a pot pie from you uh, couldn't, couldn't do so because of, of the regulations. And so what we've done is, is we've created infrastructure and paperwork regulations that are so uh, overhead, overhead uh, heavy that, that in order to birth an entrepreneurial food business, it has to be so big that the embryo is too big to be birthed. Mm. And so not only is the entrepreneur denied market access, but the consumer is denied hundreds of choices that would exist out here that, 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 that would make a more competitive, uh, choice-driven um, playing field if, if you could actually uh, do this. Now, the, the, uh, the opposition will quickly say, well, yeah, but you've got to have rules. You know, okay, but what we have right now is, for example, you can only play, you can only play football if you have a certified referee in a certified stadium with exit doors, that would, and, and so it, no, the bar no, is just so Sunday, high to play. No one can afford to do it. Exactly. Exactly. So that's what the opposition says is the level playing field. But the fact is, if, if you want to come to my farm, look around, ask around, smell around, and is and, and, and two uh, voluntary consenting adults, participate in consensual commerce, <laughs> exercising our freedom of choice, we should be able to do that without a bureaucrat being involved. There, there should be some level, there should be some level where neighbors can engage in food trade without a bureaucrat involved in the transaction at, yeah. at some point. Brilliant, brilliant. So, Joel, now where can uh, my uh, listeners and watchers on YouTube, how can they get a hold of you at Polyface Farm if, if they want to reach out and learn more about organic farming, learn more about direct marketing, uh, learn more about programs you might have? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, so our website is polyfacefarms.com. It has a, you know, a plethora of material on it. We link to a lot of things. Uh, it links, I do a daily blog, the musings from the lunatic farmer. Um, and it's, it's a little short, short little, you know, two minute blog every day, almost every Good day. Good for you. Um, and, and so, uh, so polyface, just, just Google P O L Y and the rest of it will pop up and you can see all the links, all the things there. Um, I've written 12 books. So, and two more are coming out this year. So there's a lot of information and um, yeah, I'm a huge believer in, uh, in following this, this rural agrarian passion. A lot of people don't because they've been told there's no money in farming, it can't be done. It's difficult, it's onerous, blah, blah, blah. blah. And uh, boy, never has the time been better uh, to accept newcomers into this space. It is a dynamic, wonderful time to, uh, to jump into this space. Well, fantastic. On that note, I'm going to end it. I would just like to say for everyone watching this uh, video uh, on YouTube, please give us a thumbs up if you liked it. Also, share it and be sure to subscribe. That way you'll see, be notified when we post future videos. Joel, thanks so much for being with us this afternoon. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.